Well, today we have two specialists uh, from Entrepreneur, Andy and uh, Ahmed. Ahmed. Nice yeah. to meet you guys. Yeah, they will show us the new Surface 3, how to use it. All right. So yes, as Lou said, today we're going to be talking about the Surpass 3. The Surpass uh, stands for Surface Potential uh, Analyzer for Solid sur Surfaces. And basically, this is a Zeta Potential Analyzer for solid pieces. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about how this instrument is able to uh, measure Zeta Potential, because some of you guys may be familiar with uh, particle Zeta Potential, but not necessarily uh, solid piece Zeta Potential. So uh, the theory that the surpass uses is actually called the streaming potential. Now, uh, in DLS, which is probably the more ELS, which is the more popular, more common uh, version of Zeta Potential, you generally see an electric field being applied, which is moving particles back and forth. And then you're able to measure, uh, measure the Zeta Potential that way. Instead, what we're doing here is we have two electrodes on the side of a measuring cell. And what this is allowing you to do is you have the surface or two surfaces. Uh, let's just say they're negatively charged, for example. Uh, you introduce an electrolyte solution, which is going to have both positive and negative ions. The positive ions are going to attach or basically adsorb to of the negative uh, and form a, a, a layer. When you start to pressurize the electrolyte through, one end of this uh, system, if you will, we'll start to see a decrease in positive concentration, and then the other side will start to see an increase in positive concentration of particles. So essentially you're forming a gradient. And that is essentially how we're measuring zeta potential this way. Now, why may you want to analyze the zeta potential of solid pieces? Uh, you may be wanting to understand what is the property of your membrane, which you are adding different uh, functional groups to have different behaviors if you want to maybe uh, take out certain contaminants from water, contaminants from dirt. It's very important to understand how they're going to uh, interact electrostatically or uh, via charge. So what this will allows you to do is actually measure that uh, zeta potential. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit through the hardware version of this. So this is the front of the instrument. Um, nothing too fancy here other than the name and the power button or the power indicator. Uh, if it's green, that means it's on. If it's not, that means it's off. Uh, on the back of the instrument, which I'm not sure if you guys can see from here, uh, we have a pressure controller. So essentially, uh, again, we're, we're pushing through an electrolyte from one pressure to another, uh, and then the electrode is monitoring difference in uh, streaming potential there. Uh, so this allows you to actually move uh, about up to 1.5 bar, so a little bit over atmospheric, uh, and it allows you to push the electrolyte through the sample. The other uh, pieces of interest on the back are a connection to the pH electrode. And uh, this is, of course, used to monitor the pH through the uh, span of the experiment. And then the conductivity probe, which allows you to determine conductivity. The other, uh, the last thing here is the power switch, which should be somewhere in the back right here. And then this will be used to turn the instrument on and off after, uh, during and after experiments. Generally, we would turn this instrument off when we're done, so um, you'll probably be using that more often than not. On the side of the instrument, you have a few other components as well. The main one that you see here, of course, is the measuring cell, and we'll kind of talk about these in a little bit more detail shortly. Uh, this is the uh, area where you have your electrolyte solution. Most commonly, you'll be using uh, about 0.1 or 0 0.01 uh, molar uh, KCL solution. And then it, it's uh, basically in, of course, in water. It's very, very important uh, when you're creating these solutions to use ultra high pure water. Uh, ASTM uh, one would be the uh, equivalent of the quality of water needed. Inside of this solution, we see that we have a conductivity probe. We have a pH electrode, which is used to monitor the pH. Um, if you want to do, for example, a titration from you know a basic to an acidic environment. You have a uh, basically pressure, which allows you to push through the air into the system. Uh, a acid over here, and then the uh, component for base. And these are used again to help titrate uh, from an acidic or to basic environment or vice versa during experiments. On the side over here, 
You also have these uh, pumps, which allow you to fill, uh, will basically take acid and base from your reservoirs over here. Uh, generally fills about one mil at a time, and it will then move on to the uh, system with the electrolyte. So this is what's used when you're going again from a basic to an acidic environment. Uh, also over here, we have a waste beaker. So once you're done with the analysis, you can essentially flush out the system of all of the electrolyte that you used and kind of have it all in one nice organized spot. And then lastly, when you're not using the instrument, you have this part which can hold the conductivity probe and the pH uh, probe. It's very important also to uh, for the pH probe specifically. Uh, this will be generally filled with a little bit of three molar KCL uh, to make sure that the pH probe is sitting in that. Otherwise, you don't want it to dry out. And then this just goes over here. So uh, it's called the, surf the software is called Surpass 3 software. We would simply just click that to open it. So we have here a green check mark, meaning that the instrument and the saw computer are con uh, communicating perfectly. Uh, the instrument is connected to the computer via USB, so a very uh, simple connection there in common. Uh, and then to you basically have a nice lot of information on the right hand side over here. So it tells you uh, the measuring cell that you have connected. And again, we'll kind of go into these in a little bit more detail shortly. Uh, it also, if you have the pH probe and the conductivity probe in the solution, it'll tell you what it is uh, at that current time, along with temperature. So the conductivity probe will also tell you the temperature as well. Uh, pressure and voltage, this would be determined during a measurement. So since we're not doing it right now, these are uh, basically not showing anything. And these are basically just results from a previous uh, measurement. There are a few different uh, control modes in the software. So the first one is dosage. Uh, this would essentially be used if you wanted to uh, either uh, change the pH of your solution to one or another. So for example, let's say I want to start my experiment from pH 10. I would simply select 10 and then the instrument will then proceed to add more base to the solution so that until it gets to that pH. Uh, this is definitely useful if you're looking to do a pH scan, which we'll, we'll go uh, over in a few more uh, minutes. And uh, Basically, that way you don't have to create a solution with a specific pH. The other way to do it is to add a specific amount of liquid, but to be fair, I think most people would prefer to just say the target pH that they want to go to and uh, proceed from there. Okay, so the next um, option here is rinsing. Now, you don't necessarily want to run a sample when it's dry. You want to first uh, get it used to the uh, environment and make sure that uh, the whole surface is interacting with this liquid, uh, with the electrolyte. So what you would do is you would rinse the sample a few times. Um, these settings that you see here are pretty much the standard settings that you'll be using. So uh, you would fill about 100 milliliters of the electrolyte solution, and then it's going to start from 600 millibar and, and, and go down into 200 millibar. And generally what you will see is more or less a straight line uh, when this is happening. So when you uh, you can also select the amount of rinse cycles that you want to do. Um, I would generally recommend between three and five uh, just to make sure that the surface again is wet enough uh, to have an accurate measurement. So once you're done with the rinsing, uh, you have a few different measurement modes that you can go into. Uh, the first one is zeta potential, which is simply a single point zeta uh, potential measurement. What you would do again is just select the fill volume, start pressure, stop pressure. Again, all of these settings that you see here are pretty much what you're going to be using uh, for, for almost every sample. Uh, and then zeta cycles is the amount of times that you want to repeat this measurement. So for example, if I just have a piece of poly polymer film or something, and I just want to know what the zeta potential is um, at neutral pH, uh, I could just set it to do four or five measurements, and it'll go ahead and perform that. Um, now, there's another measurement mode called uh, isoelectric point. Now, this could be used to give you a determination of what the isoelectric point is. And for uh, to go in a little more detail of that, the isoelectric point is essentially the point where the zeta potential is zero uh, for your sample. And it's going to be dependent on the pH. So if you need to find out at what pH your isoelectric point is zero, this would be a nice quick way to be able to do so. Um, 
Same thing here with the rinse and zeta cycles. This will determine, you know, how many times you either want to rinse the sample before the measurement or how many times you want to perform the actual measurement. And then pH step will be, you know, what are the increments between pHs uh, that you want the instrument to go to? So you can have ask for larger steps. Say maybe I want to go uh, pH 3, pH 4, pH 5, pH 6. Or if I want to do something smaller like pH 6.5 to pH 8.5 and in increments of 0.2. So that is isoelectric point. The next one is pH scan, and this is probably going to be the most common um, mode that you will use for the instrument. So what this does is it's going to start a measurement from the desired pH. So this is where it comes in handy to first do dosage and select where you want to start. For full characterization, you'll probably most uh, you'll probably see uh, experiments starting from pH 10 going all the way down to about pH 3 or pH 2. So what you're going to want to do is make sure that the pH is all the way up there first at, at 10. And then you're going to put the end pH value. So let's just say 3, for example. Uh, rinse cycles, again, it's the same thing. It's how many times you want to rinse the uh, sample with the electrolyte prior to measurement. And then zeta cycles is how many times you want to repeat the point. And then when, uh, the pH step, again, is just how many spaces between the uh, pHs or what increment of pHs you want to analyze at. And this is the measurement mode that will pretty much allow you to see an entire um, pH scan of your, of your sample. So from a low pH to a high pH, you'll learn information such as the isoelectric point, which will kind of give you an indicator of whether your sample or your surface is naturally more acidic or basic. And at what pH is it, uh, you know, have acidic or basic properties? And a lot of people will basically try to tailor their material uh, to exhibit certain behaviors or exhibit certain um, acidity or basics, uh, basicity. Um, lastly, well, first we'll have to turn on uh, the nitrogen here. Lastly, we have something called adsorption kinetics. Uh, so the instrument uh, not only can it be used for flat sheet membranes or, or you know, wafers on um, you know, CMP wafers, it could also be used for quite a lot of different samples. So anything from hair, if people want to analyze, uh, is my shampoo cleaning my hair uh, in a good way? Uh, is it effective at doing this? You can actually measure the adsorption of shampoo onto you know hair, whether it's you know fake or human hair, horse hair, whatever and then rinse it off and see what the zeta potential change is with that type of experiment. Uh, another potential example is uh, biomaterials. If you have a implant that's supposed to go into the body, you want to see how it interacts with proteins to see if the body's either going to accept or reject uh, this implant. So these, can be, these studies can be done by adsorption kinetics, uh, where you basically introduce a certain concentration of whatever adsorptive you want. Again, whether it's a protein, whether it is shampoo, conditioner, detergent, um, just something random. Um, and then you can do these experiments to see how uh, that actually happens and how that, uh, the affinity for that on the surface of your material. There are two modes here. So fast adsorption is if you just want to do a few points and to see kind of how that, uh, if you expect your material to adsorb this uh, adsorptive quickly. And then slow adsorption is, is a much, uh, allows you to have a lot more data points for the, that entire measurement. Uh, as you saw over here, I had to click on this nitrogen purge. The instrument, like as, as I said earlier, has its own uh, pressure control. That only goes to about 1.5 uh, bar, so a little bit over atmospheric. What you'll need to do if you want to go to higher pressures is connect it to a nitrogen tank. Um, and you already have the tubing for this and everything, so Basically, if you need to do adsorption kinetics or if you ever think that you just need to go to higher pressures to get good linear data, um, then that's uh, basically what you, you would select this nitrogen on button uh, and, and have that going for you. The other purpose that it has is to remove any dissolved CO2 from the electrolyte. So um, it's very important also to try to use, as I said before, pure liquids when you can and pure solutions. Uh, the purest water you can get um, HCL and, and uh, NaOH that don't have any uh, other stabilizers or anything in there because um, all of these were going to show up and have an impact on the measurement. So uh, one thing I'll do then is I'm going to show you guys just briefly how to change the measurement cells and the different types of measurement cells that we have. Um, 
So right now what I have is the cleaning cell. When a measurement is complete, actually let's take a move back to the software real quick. Uh, you're going to want to clean out the system because you don't want all that acid and base and you don't want um, all that electrolyte just sitting in the system. So uh, you would basically just click this clean button over here. You're going to empty the system and basically this would remove any of the electrolyte that you have in the measuring cell. So because that way, if you were to remove the measuring cell without taking this step, a whole bunch of water is going to come out with it. So this kind of helps it uh, be a little bit more cleanly in that regard. Uh, once you're done for the day, you're going to want to clean the system. And this is going to, again, just uh, cycle through uh, the system with hopefully a, a, a beaker of DI water, if you have that nearby, or ultra high pure water. And it's going to cycle that through the system to make sure that everything's clean. Um, and if we can kind of just show here. So essentially what you would want to do for the first one, which is empty the system, you need to have this cleaning cell attached and it's just going to flush through and clean everything. For the second option, which is clean the system, you're going to want to first lift this out, remove the beaker with the electrolytes, and then you I don't have it, but you would just bring in another beaker filled with clean water, and then it's going to cycle and flush through the system. The other thing you're going to need to do is move this pump over here and attach it to the waste beaker. And this is going to allow that all of the water that just got introduced to the system so that it flushes out of the system over here. There's also an option here to fill the titration units. This has already been done um, as of today for the installation, and you probably won't need to do this too often. But if you do, essentially what's happening is you would, uh, first of all, just maybe be cleaning the acid in the base. And uh, what you would do is essentially just put DI water and then you can uh, basically clean this out by just going to a titration fill, a titrator fill. Once you clean it out, you're going to then add, uh, these are 0.05 molar HCl uh, for the acid and 0.05 molar NaCl for the base. You're gonna re-add it to these bottles over here. And then you would click the fill the titration units on the computer. And what that'll do is it's gonna rinse out the and, and allow the titration units to fill with the acid and base again. And you're not going to need to do this too often, maybe just when you, you know, a couple of times uh, every other month or so, um, or when you run out of solution and need to introduce a new solution. Uh, those would be the times that you really want to do a, a titration fill. So then we can talk a little bit about the cells over here. So on the right hand side of the instrument, uh, where basically everything happens, there is this lever. Um, you would just essentially remove that lever. Um, on the on the software, you can actually notice that now the instrument is not connected or the measuring cell is deactivated. Uh, you cannot run a measurement if you have uh, the lever in this position. Uh, it's a nice little safety feature if you want to call it that. Uh, but what this allows you to do is remove the measuring cell from here. So. Um, inside of the measuring cell, so this one is a cleaning cell. There's actually no sample inside of it. Uh, but you can just see it has a couple o-rings for sealing and then it sits into the uh, measuring area like this it's also very important all of these measuring cells have an arrow and this arrow will basically tell you at what uh, direction to put the cell in so if i wanted to put it like this for example it won't work but you know with the arrow pointing up everything's good to go so um the first one we have is actually called the verification cell, and we put some stickers on here for you guys. Uh, the verification cell is what's used to run a standard, um, and in this case, we actually just run a cotton sheet. Uh, this one has a zeta potential between minus 18 and minus 22, 22 millivolts, and you don't have to worry about measure, uh, memorizing that. All of these numbers are in the manual, uh, which a copy has been saved on the instrument, and then Lou will have uh, copies as well. Um, but essentially what you would do for the verification cell, um, if you're using this instrument like once a week or once every other week, I would highly recommend just doing a cotton run just to, you know, it's more of a sanity check uh, more than anything. So you would just remove these two screws over here. And then you'll see that it's actually two pieces. Uh, the top half, you know, just O-rings for sealing. And then on the bottom part, you actually have this piece here where you can fit a sample. We have these tools here that help to loosen up this uh, sample holder. 
And if you notice, it's a little wet. It's because we've recently used it. Um, and then essentially what you would do is you would fold this piece of paper into a one by one square. So it's actually, um, I guess I could just do it for demonstration purposes. You would fold it one time, two times, three times, and four times. And then it's going to sit in here. It's very important also to make sure that there's uh, not a lot of loose pieces or fibers that are popping out of there. It needs to be uh, pretty nice and compact. Otherwise, if you have too much flow going through, you're going to notice that it's just not going to give you good data. So after that, we'll just attach this over here and then tighten it. And it doesn't need to be too tight, just, you know, one or two, uh, I think, no, you can't really say finger tight in this regard, but, um, all right. So once that's done, you would put it back into here, reattach the screws on top. This one you can say finger tight, so yeah, you would definitely uh, just have them finger tight over here. And then you reattach it. So I had the arrow point in the wrong direction there. You would reattach it over here. Hit the lever. Now the instrument says that it automatically recognizes that the verification cell is there. So this is what I would do for, you know, your first time using the instrument, just do a little nice test run here. And also just to make sure that the instrument is working within spec. Once this is complete, um, there are a many different types of sample cells we have. Like I said, we can really analyze a lot of different materials here. Uh, the most common one that we have and, and the one that you guys have here is called the adjustable gap cell. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail in terms of how to run it or how to use it uh, because we actually have videos that are already pre-made on how to do that. These are also going to be saved on the computer uh, where the instrument is. And they're actually also on YouTube. So you guys can actually just Google or, or go on YouTube and type in Surf S3 adjustable gap cell. And it's right there. So um, we don't have them at this time, but we also have uh, one called the cylindrical cell. This one can be used on powders. This one can be used on fibers. Uh, we have hollow fiber cells if someone's looking at you know membrane materials through hollow fibers. Um, glass vial cells if someone's trying to understand if a protein is absorbing on the surface of a uh, like a glass vial. You know you can do measurements of that. And then yeah, we have a lot of different measuring cells for this instrument. So. Uh, as the need comes or as you have requests from your colleagues or your research changes, uh, we probably have a cell that can cover it. Um, but for the time being, we have the adjustable gap cell. This one is used on flat uh, materials. So, you know, polymer membranes are a good example, thin films, uh, anything that can basically be cut into a flat, uh, you know, 20 by 10 millimeter uh, material rectangle, they can be analyzed on this. So, um, yeah, that's about it for the surpass, and I'm open to taking any questions that you guys may have. Hi, yes, Hi. Uh, I have a question. Uh, so, is there any specific thickness that I mean you have to use for the sample? Like, if I am using a polymer sample, mm -hmm. is there any specific thickness? Yeah, it's a good question. So, if, with the adjustable gap cell, um, I guess I will take it apart just to help demonstrate this. There is a um, a gap height of about 100, uh, 100 millimeters that you want to have. So, um, if you are, I would generally say maybe less than a, a micron thick is what you're looking at for these samples. If you need something thicker, we actually have a sample cell for that called the clamping cell. Um, but if you can see right here, essentially you're going to want a flat, uh, this, I don't know if this, there we go, a flat piece that sits on top of this rectangle that you see right here. Um, so you're really not looking at too much thickness. Um, if you, if you have something that is thicker than I'd say like a, a micron, you're probably going to want to use something called the clamping cell. Um, what, uh, do you know what the, uh, thickness of your polymer films are? Yeah, it's pretty much like 200 microns, something like that. Micron. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
it's worth a shot. I don't think, uh, again, if it's when you're going to higher levels of thickness, you probably want to go with the clamping cell. Uh, but for the time being, as long as it can cover this surface and still be able to produce a gap that is 100, uh, 100 millimeters, or, uh, sorry, it's 100, yeah, 100 micron and smaller, uh, then it's fine. Because essentially what's happening is with this um, knob over here, uh, and when it's closed, you're actually trying to bring these closer and closer together to close this gap. So okay. uh, this is more or less what, you, uh, what you're up against with, with your sample. Uh, but it's uh, we just need a different cell if you have samples that are quite thick. It's not uh, out of the realm of possibilities. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Uh, other general requirements on what samples we can use. I feel like these both of these questions kind of tie into each other. So the adjustable gap, I would think of this as your flat surface uh, membrane or thin film type of uh, cell. We also have cells for powders, uh, 25 micron and larger. So that is one of the uh, limitations of that one. Um, for zeta potential of you know small micron or nanoparticles, DLS or ELS is the way to go, or dynamic light scattering or electrophoretic. Uh, but if for materials or powders or just you know chunks or pieces of material that are larger than 25 micron, this uh, the surpass can be used. And for that cell, you're going to want what's called the, the cylindrical cell. It actually kind of looks similar to the verification cell that we have here, um, in the sense that it is a it has that same uh, cell holder where you would essentially just put your material. Um, we have, and then to answer your question more, I mean we have contact uh, contact uh, lenses, uh, cells for contact lenses, cells for one inch cores uh, for people that are interested in shale and, and things from the ground. We have, um, what else? We have the clamping cell, which is used for thicker samples. Uh, there's actually another version of the adjustable gap that is for specifically, I think, 14 or 15 millimeter uh, thickness samples. Um, what else? We have, like I said, sample cells for pre-filled syringes. If you're looking to study the uh, solid liquid interface of a, you know, the glass or whatever type of syringe it is, uh, and whether it's going to absorb any protein that's in your solution, um, same with vials. Uh, that's another one of the sample cells that we have. Yeah, so the cylindrical cell is going to have a piece that's pretty similar to this. Uh, and it, it, I, essentially, you're going to want to clamp down the uh, powder or pellets or whatever material it is that you have, um, or fiber, I guess is probably the, the better one. And it's enough to be able to make sure that there's no large gaps inside of here. Because what you don't want is just a lot of liquid permeating through at one time. You want it to go through um, at a steady stream and not kind of have too much signal for the electrodes. So as you can see here, this uh, cotton fiber is pretty much uh, mush and, and very flat. Uh, that's more or less what you were aiming to achieve with most samples. So yeah, you can see it's uh, pretty flat from after that measurement. Um, of course, it's wet with, the, well, we didn't actually do a measurement, but uh, if it was wet, and uh, we would have basically had a very flat, wet piece of cotton here um, with very, very small holes in here to make sure that they don't, uh, we don't have a lot of uh, liquid streaming through all at one time. So any questions on software, hardware? Uh, I'm not sure if I mentioned it, but all of the experimental runs are exported to Excel and saved on the computer. So you can either see it in an XLS, uh, XSLS file or a .csv file. Uh, very important not to delete the CSV file because that's the raw data more or less, uh, but that's all saved on the computer automatically, so you don't have to worry about uh, trying to export things to create uh, reports in Excel. All right, so we'll do a measurement of the verification uh, cell. We'll put the cotton back in. So once that's ready, we just enter it here into the verification cell. Okay. So arrow up. Let's see how 
in there, close the lever, the instrument will tell you what cell you have connected. And then if we were to start a measurement, the first thing that we need to do is rinse the sample with the electrolyte solution. Um, I believe I mentioned this earlier, but just for repetition's sake, we are running a 0 0.01 molar KCL solution. Um, and that's more or less what you'll be using. You can use other salts. You can use NACL, uh, things with different ionic strengths. But for the most part, uh, KCL is uh, more than sufficient for most samples. Um, to start a measurement, we're first going to rinse. Um, and in this case, we'll rinse it about five times. Well, actually, just for the sake of uh, time, we'll do it three times. Uh, again, all of these parameters that you see here are pretty much what you're going to be using for every sample. Uh, you're going to fill with about 100 milliliters of uh, electrolyte solution. The beaker is only about 250 mils. So if you ask for more, uh, you're going to have to use either a bigger beaker um, or you just won't have enough electrolytes to actually fill uh, the measuring cell. But like I said, 100 mils is usually enough. You have 200 in here rough uh, generally, so should be good for most of your measurements. The start and stop pressure. Uh, these are the recommended ones. Uh, 600 millibar start, 200 millibar stop. Uh, and then we're just going to rinse the sample now. So you can kind of see what's happening right now where the electrolyte is going to be start to be drawn into the instrument. Uh, can you guys see good? Okay. So what's happening now is that the instrument is filling with the electrolyte solution. And then it's actually going to start flowing through the sample like this from bottom to top, bottom to top. Okay, we can start to see a curve starting to form right here where the pressure is um, starting here from about 500 millibar down to uh, well, 200. Oh, a little bit under 200. And when you're rinsing your sample, uh, generally the first one is going to look a different, a little different from the second and third or fourth runs, uh, mainly because this is the first time that the sample is interacting with the liquid. Um, over here on the right hand side, you may notice something called the permeability index. Each of the sample cells are, is going to have a little parameter that will determine if you have too much flow or if the gap's too big uh, between the either the two pieces or in this case the one the cloth itself. Uh, for the verification cell, uh, permeability between 100 and 130 is ideal. So we're smack dab in the middle right here. Um, there's again for other sample cells, you're going to have different parameters, and these are going to be listed in both the video and in the manual um, for for each of those. So you don't have to go running for uh, you know, information; it should be all there for you. Um, but yeah, after the sample is initially wet, you'll start to see the second and third and fourth runs basically overlap each other. So you can see over here that the pressure is dropping, streaming resistance is, is determined there as well. And then it's starting the last measurement now, or the last rinse. So the permeability went up from 114 to 115. That's more or less ideal. You want it to be pretty close to what the previous value is. You don't want to see large changes in permeability or gap height, again, depending on which cell you're using. OK. 
OK, and that's it. So now that the sample has been rinsed, we would assume that the surface is completely wet uh, with the electrolytes and that you have sufficient um, ions that are, that are attached to the, the surface or, or adsorbed. So now what we would do is we would do a, a zeta potential measurement here. So in this case, we're not really interested in the pH scan. We're just going to do a single point zeta potential test. Again, all of the parameters that we'd mentioned before will stay the same. 100 mill, milliliters of fill volume, start pressure at 600 millibar, stop pressure at 200 millibar, and let's run this for, um, let's say, four cycles. Again, uh, we usually, the first one we generally don't uh, accept. The second, third, fourth, or fifth it would be the ones that we uh, actually take as the values. So uh, we'll go ahead and quick start. And then, yeah. It, Instrument indicates here that it's doing the voltage or zeta potential measurement. So, so the instrument's currently draining the uh, electrolytes, introducing it to the system. Okay, so we can see the pressure drop here and then the voltage change with it and then we're going to get a information on the permeability and then the zeta potential. So 115, and then we're at negative 16.12 millivolts for the first run. Does the polymer film have to be permeable? Um, good question. Uh, the answer is no, because what you're actually doing again with this the adjustable gap cell is making a channel. So you have two, you're basically going to cut out two pieces of film. Uh, one will be, here, let me see if I can better demonstrate this. Can you use this yeah, so let's just switch around here. Okay, so what we're actually doing is you're going to want to have your film, uh, the, the surface that you're interested in characterizing, you know, both sides are the same, then it doesn't matter which way you do it. But if you have a, a functionalized surface or maybe a non porous surface for whatever reason, um, you can basically make sure that it's on the top, oops, there we go, on the top part here. Um, and then you'll do the same for the other side of the cell. So essentially, you're just looking at the surface of both of these materials. So uh, the film doesn't necessarily need to be permeable, permeable to answer your question. Um, I think when you're thinking permeability, probably factors like pore size or, or uh, um, flow rate may be of importance. But here, we're just measuring the charge of the surface. So uh, did you answer your question? OK. So here we have the second run here. Uh, you can kind of see them overlaying. And this is more or less what you want to see. You want to see uh, pretty uh, vertical curves here, just going uh, from one direction to the other. Um, you can also switch from measurement view to result view to compare the two numbers to each other. So uh, I know that looks big in terms of distance, but really it's just 16.1 and 16.5 uh, millivolts. Um, and then you can see some slight Changing here, the pH, uh, not not too much, 5.7 of 5.71. So uh, this is more or less what we expect to see. All right, we can see a third the blue curve forming over here, and it's you know falling again in line with uh, all the previous ones. And they're all very close. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, this is what you expect to see. Right. That that means that the sample, there's no like gaps or anything in the way that was, it was prepared. Um, and that means that nothing's really being washed from the surface as well. So, so let's say if the uh, couple measurements are so far away from each other, mm -hmm. what's the possible? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. It could be something that was previously in the sample being washed off, um, or it could just be that you are starting to see gaps or something, or this maybe you just have a hole. The sample just couldn't handle water okay. flowing through. Uh -huh. um, 
or uh, it literally just like got displaced. Th those are potential, or the gap maybe is not consistent. So those would be maybe some potential reasons there. Um, you could always you know check and make sure that your acid and base or your electrolyte is pure again, because any little bit of uh, you know um, uh, things that you don't want in there could ha affect the results as well. Thank you. Or contaminants, things of that sort. Uh, one thing I'll also briefly mention uh, while this last run is finishing is that for pH titrations, uh, if you're starting from, you know, again, I'll give that example of pH 10 down to pH 3. Uh, we have some magnetic stir rods that you would want to put one of them at the bottom of the beaker here um, when you're doing your titrations, just to make sure that all of the electrolyte solution is at the same pH. Uh, you can see the actual measurements, like I said, from the pressure, starting pressure down to the ending pressure. Um, you can see the results in this type of view to see how much variation there is uh, in, you know, not much in zeta potential here, you know, 16.1 down to 16.6, I guess you could say. Um, and with this, that would basically be your experiment. Of course, the uh, well, again, what I think most likely is of interest to most people is the pH scan. Uh, these are much longer experiments. These would be probably within the span of three to, you know, three hours or longer, depending on how uh, how big of increments you have between the pH uh, steps, and then how many cycles or how many data points you want per uh, test. Um, and once that's complete, uh, all of the data is saved in the documents folder. There's a folder called Surpass. You basically every time you start a new measurement, you give it a name. In this case, just put my initials here. Uh, this is the experiment name I had, and uh, we can just go in here to zeta potential. Well, these are all the individual measurements. Uh, just just kind of show you what they look like in. Um, there we go. Together, we have all that here. So uh, these are the individual runs. The zeta potential is presented in volts. Generally, it's in millivolts, but. Um, uh, I think the standard is in Excel to show it in volts. And then you can see all the numbers here and uh, along with some of the other raw data that may be useful for uh, just either exper uh, calculation purposes or just to have on hand. So uh, again, if there's any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, we'll leave our cards here and emails uh, so you guys can contact us if you have any questions prior to starting a measurement. Um, interest in other sample cells to accommodate different sample types and also uh, basically if you have any questions or need help or support either myself or Ahmed can help you out with that so uh, thank you guys very much thank you yeah, all right so I, I guess since we're at the end of the experiment uh, we could just do another one one last overview of what to do what you would want to do is click clean and you're going to want to empty the system. That's the first thing that you do. And this is going to empty the sample cell that you're using to make sure that there's no, uh, not a bunch of water just still in there. Because essentially, again, if you were to try to remove it right now, you would, you know, make a not a big mess, but there'd be some water that spills out. If you want to do the measurements at any specific pH values, how do you do that? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, the easiest way to do that without actually changing the pH, uh, you know, and during wet chemistry would be to go to dosage and then you can just select the target pH that you want. And, and this would be a step that you do prior to measurements such as uh, what well, you're probably going to want to do is before you rinse. So let's say, for example, you want to just see an experiment from pH 4 to pH 6, and you want to start at pH 6, you would just uh, dose to target pH uh, 6, click start, and it would add, in this case, the right amount of uh, base to be able to go up uh, to that pH. So we had, uh, oh, you're welcome. Uh, we had cleaned the system already. Uh, sorry, we have emptied the cell. So what I'm going to do now is just switch out the electrolyte solution. Uh, we have to, okay. I'm just going to switch out the electrolyte solution here. Um, with just some DI water. And then the other thing I'm going to do is uh, there's this the second piece of tubing on this end. 
is going to actually go through the waste. Because generally what's happening is it's filling, uh, going through the sample cell, and then when this is in here, it allows you to recycle and reuse the electrolytes. Uh, but we don't want to do that anymore since we're done with the experiment. We just want to put it in its own waste so that we can uh, dispose of it properly. So uh, we'll put that over here, put this back down, and then we'll do clean the system. So I'm going to take out the verification cell, put in the cleaning cell, and then we can click start. Okay. Yeah, and it, in case you guys forget, again, it gives you the instructions of what to do right here. Uh, it tells you to connect the outlet hose to the waste speaker and then replace the measuring solution by 200 milliliters of a cleaning solution. Again, most of the time, water is fine. The only times that you may want to look at something uh, uh, with some either surfactant or something of the sort may be with uh, when you're doing the adsorption kinetics. Um, that, that may be a time where you want to do a little bit more of an intense cleaning. But again, for just regular measurements, water, DI water, you know, high pure water is fine. You may notice that there's probably a, a good bit of downtime between steps. So this is definitely an instrument that you don't need to be sitting in front of all of the time. Uh, especially for some of your experiments, you can, you know, set it and come back a couple hours later and, uh, you know, have the results that way. So it doesn't require having users around all the time. Um, it's very freeing in that regard. Okay, so that's it. At this point, we would um, just, uh, if you want to move the camera over here. Yeah. Uh, since the instrument's completely cleaned out, we can see that the uh, beaker of water is empty, more or less. The waste beaker is pretty full, so we would just empty out the waste beaker. Um, once this is done, we would put the conductivity standard, uh, or sorry, probe back. And then, very important, uh, put the pH electrode back in the KCL solution. Uh, but you probably want to change it about every month, just uh -huh. like you want to do with the acid in the base. Um, the uh, pH electrode, you need to measure it with buffers uh -huh. uh, every week. And we have we have two of them in my hand. There's one more over there. Mm -hmm. uh, you want buffers of 4, 7, and 10, uh, pH 4, 7, and 10. The conductivity electrode, you uh, check once a month. That's actually checked with 0.1 molar KCL. And you don't have to worry about remembering this because the instrument's going to tell you. you have okay. to do it again. So it's again, oh, very good. automated. There's no need to worry or you know, have that always in your mind because the instrument will tell you. Good, good. Yeah. All right, and just want to make sure that the head of the uh, oh, pH probe is uh, covered in this pH in the uh, KCL solution. So once that's it, you just put it in here. Put the conductivity probe in here. Conductivity and temperature probe. And temperature probe. <laughs> <laughs> and then voila, that's it. So uh, at this point, you can just turn off the instrument. Uh, it's in the back. The, uh, the switch is in the back. And uh, next time you uh, use it again, just be I sure. I don't need to create the software. Or... You can close the software. I mean, no, I, I mean, it's it can just work solo, right? Just by you can the software it, you can view data, sure. Okay. Um, but again, everything's exported to Excel, so okay. most of the time. I mean, it is nice and a little more visual there than right, Excel. Right, right, right. So yeah, so you, you can certainly use it as a uh, more of a data, you know, data reduction data, type yeah, sure. of um, tool. Uh -huh. But yeah, primarily it's used just for. Uh, analysis and setting and I testing see. of the instrument. Okay. All right, so turn it off and that's it. Okay, great. Right. Thank you guys very much. Thank and like you. I said, for once you guys actually start using the instruments, all the measurement cells, uh, you have them saved on the computer and then they're saved on YouTube. So type in Surpass 3, you know, measuring cell, you have a lot of different options there uh, with good seven to eight minute long videos with every detail on how to prepare your sample for testing. Okay. Okay. okay, guys, that's it. That's all. Thank you all to, uh, for joining us. You're an awesome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Take care.